Imagine waking up and feeling nothing. The things that once made you smile, your favorite food, music, or even time with loved ones, now feels distant, muted, or empty. If you've ever felt this way, you're not alone. Today, we're breaking down anhedonia, not just what it is, but why it happens, how to measure it, and most importantly, what you can do about it. Anhedonia isn't just about losing pleasure. It's about losing connection to the world around you. It's a major symptom in depression and other mental health conditions, and likely a trans diagnostic feature. By the end of this video, you'll know why anhedonia happens in the brain, two, how it affects motivation and daily life, three, how it's measured clinically, and four, what treatments and strategies help. But first, let's answer the big question. Why does the brain stop experiencing pleasure? The science behind anhedonia. Welcome to Psychiatry Simplified. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist. If you're interested in all things psychiatry, neuroscience, and mental health related, then this is the channel for you. Please hit the subscribe button to stay in touch with all our future videos. The term anhedonia comes from the Greek words an, without, and idoni, pleasure. It was first described in 1896 by psychologist Ribo, but only recently have we begun to understand what's happening in the brain. At its core, anhedonia is a disruption in the brain's reward system, the brain's way of processing motivation, pleasure, and learning. This system involves three key areas. First, the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex plans and assigns value to rewards. It's also the seat of executive function, planning, sequencing, error detection, error monitoring, completing tasks. Two, the ventral striatum, also known as the nucleus accumbens. This is often termed the reward center. This generates the feeling of pleasure. And third, the dopaminergic system. The dopaminergic system drives anticipation, motivation, and reinforcement. When these systems stop functioning properly, activities that should feel rewarding don't. People with anhedonia describe it as feeling emotionally flat, like life is happening in grayscale. But anhedonia isn't just about the lack of pleasure. Anhedonia is a concept that involves learning, it involves reinforcement, it involves pleasure, and it also involves motivational pathways. There are three main types of anhedonia. One, incentive anhedonia or anticipatory anhedonia. This is a disruption in the drive or urge to pursue rewarding experiences involving effort and determination. Two, consummatory anhedonia. This is the inability to feel pleasure in the moment. For example, not enjoying food or not enjoying music, smelling a flower and just not feeling anything. And third, motivational, also at times known as appetitive anhedonia. This is the lack of motivation or desire to seek out rewards, not wanting to make plans or try new things. Note, this is not just about seeking out pleasure, but seeking out reward and reinforcement, the things that keep us going in life. These distinctions reveal that anhedonia isn't just about diminished feelings. It's also about diminished systems of urge, drive, and affective states. So how is anhedonia measured clinically? Clinicians use several scales to assess anhedonia, but the most widely used is the SHAP scale, which is the Snaith hamilton Pleasure Scale. This self-report questionnaire, as you can see here, evaluates a person's ability to experience pleasure across different domains of life, such as food and drink. For example, I would enjoy my favorite meal, something one can rate. Social interactions, I would enjoy being with my friends. Sensory experiences, I would enjoy a warm bath or shower. Hobbies and interests, I would enjoy my favorite pastime. Participants rate their agreement with statements on a scale, helping clinicians quantify the severity of anhedonia. A high SHAP score indicates significant difficulty experiencing pleasure or rewards, making it a useful tool in diagnosis and treatment monitoring. This becomes extremely important when we're treating depression, schizophrenia with predominant negative symptoms, or other conditions such as PTSD, OCD, etc., all of which can have anhedonia 
at the core of the illness. Now, how does a clinician differentiate anhedonia? There are a few aspects to take into account. These include broadly symptoms versus signs, trait versus state anhedonia, three, pervasive versus selective anhedonia, and four, the dimensional perspective of anhedonia. So let's look at each one. First, symptoms versus signs. Symptoms refer to subjective complaints like loss of interest. So a question that can be asked is, have you lost interest in activities that you would normally enjoy doing? Signs are observable behaviors such as lack of positive emotion or social withdrawal. Family members can often provide that information stating so-and-so is just existing, doesn't seem to be present when he's playing with children. Some individuals may experience anhedonic alexithymia, which is struggling to express or articulate pleasure-related emotions. Two, trait versus state anhedonia. Now, anhedonia can either be a trait, meaning a persistent vulnerability factor in conditions, for example, like schizophrenia, where there might be a core biological affliction of the reward system. It can also be a state occurring temporarily during depressive episodes. Recognizing whether anhedonia is trait or state-based in its presentation is key in choosing the right treatment approach. Third, we look at pervasive versus selective anhedonia. Pervasive anhedonia affects all areas of life, social, cognitive, physical while selective anhedonia may affect only certain domains, such as social interaction, but might not affect food or hobbies. And this is because some pleasures are instinctual, food or socializing, whilst others are learned, and that might require greater effort, making it more vulnerable for selective anhedonia to occur. There's a negative experience that is linked to those pursuits. Fourth, dimensional perspective. Rather than viewing anhedonia as all or nothing, we now see it as a spectrum. And this dimensional view helps clinicians assess severity and therefore tailor treatments accordingly. So as I mentioned earlier, anhedonia is best conceptualized as a transdiagnostic symptom. It isn't exclusive just to depression. It's found in schizophrenia, where it becomes part of negative symptoms, post-traumatic stress disorder, where emotional numbing, detachment or depersonalization, derealization, dissociation occurs, ADHD, where dopamine dysregulation affects motivation. Anxiety disorders, fear-driven avoidance can contribute to anhedonia. Recognizing anhedonia's transdiagnostic nature becomes very, very important for not only designing better treatments, but also to treat psychiatric disorders effectively. So what are the treatment principles to address anhedonia? First, medications that target the reward system. Now we know that traditional antidepressants such as SSRIs are monoaminergic. They increase levels of serotonin in the synaptic cleft by blocking CERT, but we know for motivation and reward, dopamine plays a very important role. And therefore, they're not particularly effective in targeting anhedonia, and one of their side effects is emotional blunting as well. Therefore, when it comes to medication, one can consider broader spectrum agents ones that increase dopamine and noradrenaline. For example, bupropion is an NDRI, noradrenergic dopaminergic reuptake inhibitor, increases dopamine and norepinephrine. Vortioxetine, which is a multimodal antidepressant, which enhances cognitive and emotional processing. Agomelatine is an M1, M2 agonist and a 5-HT2C antagonist. The combination of these two mechanisms increases noradrenaline and dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. Ketamine an NMDA antagonist, but at higher doses also potentiates dopamine, can rapidly at times restore pleasure. Moving away from medication, we have neuromodulation. Brain stimulation strategies such as transcranial magnetic stimulation, which targets brain regions such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which then has a downward cascade towards activating the reward pathways. We have deep brain stimulation, which is currently experimental, but can directly stimulate the nucleus accumbens, the reward pathway. We know that deep brain stimulation is used in treatment refractory depression and OCD as well. Third, behavioral activation. Now this is something that can be implemented in all cases of anhedonia and therefore can be considered the gold standard. 
And this is engaging in activities before you feel like it. Because what we know, and I often do this in clinical practice, is I tell patients that the reward cascade doesn't have motivation right at the start. Motivation is a byproduct of action. It begins with action, whereby when we repetitively do that action, rehearsal, repetition, it provides a sense of reward learning. Note, it doesn't have to be pleasurable, but the greater mastery we achieve with whatever activity we choose, and the more it embeds in our routine, the more likely we are to enhance reward learning, one component of anhedonia. It's only after this mastery do we then have the motivational hedonic drive. Let me give you a simple example. At this point in time, you're viewing this video, you are anticipating a reward. You might not actively know it, but you're watching this video because you anticipate a payoff. This is your anticipatory hedonic drive. Once the video is over, you will consummate it. This is your consummatory hedonic drive where you will assign a value to this video and potentially the channel as a result. The motivational aspects, which is really about do I want to watch other videos, is the motivational hedonic drive. That will be dependent on the value that you got from this or other videos. And you can see this is a cycle that maintains and moves the individual towards further learning. So therefore, an important caveat though, is before engaging in activities, we've got to recognize that if the individual has significant psychomotor retardation, for example, we may need medication, we may need to address the significant mood disturbance before the individual can engage in activities. However, it's helpful to consider behavioral activation as early as possible. And this results in rebuilding positive reinforcement through repetition. And fourth, we have psychotherapy approaches where we can implement cognitive behavioral therapy, where often negative distorted beliefs or negative dysfunctional assumptions in relation to maybe a task or one's confidence can be addressed. And this can assist in enhancing that pleasure and reward. Mindfulness-based therapy increases awareness and acceptance. Social connection strategies are crucial. Even small interactions can help reverse anhedonia. So what's the key message? Anhedonia doesn't have to be permanent. The brain is capable of rewiring itself through neuroplasticity and with the right treatment, motivation and pleasure can return. In summary, it's a breakdown in the brain's reward system. It can be measured using the SHAP scale. It's transdiagnostic and therefore can be a feature in a range of psychiatric conditions. Treatment principles include medication, neurostimulation, and non-medication strategies like CBT, behavioral activation, and targeted psychotherapy. If you found this video helpful, hit the like button. It really helps the channel. Please subscribe to the channel to stay in touch with all our future videos. And drop a comment below. What's one thing you want to learn more about mental health? A big thank you to all of you for supporting this channel. I look forward to seeing you in another video soon. Until then, stay curious. Bye-bye.